So yes, I'm going to change scale a little bit here and try to compress um, some of the uh, the sort of salient tectonic geodynamics uh, understandings we have of the evolution of North East Queensland. So I'll have to skip a little bit of it, but uh, we'll, we'll get, try to get through it. So if you don't know me, I spent my time between consulting and teaching and research at Monash University. The reason I, uh, I put that slide up there is because some of the work I'm going to show you today has generated research outcomes that are, that are being taken to the Monash research side. So we started off with a, a consulting job with GSQ and it's generated quite a lot of questions because as we realise in the area, it's quite complicated and it's been quite understudied. Um, so the vision behind when we first uh, were contracted with GSQ was to try to uh, provide a synthesis of the geology of Northeast Queensland in a way that was uh, digestible to the first time explorer or to a new geologist in the area. And the challenge is obviously to try to avoid complications um, and try to simplify the lithostratigraphy down and reconcile all the new data into a coherent evolution. Um, and obviously to try and to put the new Northeast Queensland into the context of the wider Tasmanites as well. Um, and as we get through the talk, we'll also talk about some of the exploration uh, implications as well. So what we delivered to uh, GSQ back in the day was uh, a large sort of 180 page report that included uh, a breakdown of the geology of each of the domains um, that we defined in, in North Queen, Northeast Queensland, a series of time space plots, which I think is still a really good resource um, that uh, is available to, to disseminate out to, to young, young or new explorers that will help them get into the, the, you know, the major packages, the deformation schemes and those things, as well as um, cross sections and uh, geophysical interpretation based at uh, one to a five million scale and some geodynamic uh, sort of uh, semi-cartoon schematics um, that were based in GIS um, that uh, we'll also go through as well. And as I mentioned at the bottom of the slide there, uh, you, these are available via GSQ or you can contact me if, if Helen and GSQ are happy for that to happen. Um, so let's go really big picture and say why is Northeast Queensland so important and relevant? Well, what we see in, in Northeast Queensland in the Mossman, Mossman origin um, is essentially a telescoped version of everything we're seeing from the Adelaide fold belt in the west all the way through to the eastern Lachlan. So we, uh, we're looking in Northeast Queensland at not just a near protozoic and all division complex, not just uh, near protozoic to Carboniferous, or, or the younger New England fold belt, but we're seeing a neoprotozoic to Triassic um, series of orogenic um, belts that are telescoped almost on top of each other. So that opens up the uh, exploration window to different deposit types based on whether you're searching for classic uh, orogenic gold systems like we'd find in the Lachlan or into your more critical metals um, in, in, in Northeast Queensland. So I think that's uh, a good place to start to get into context. The time space plot here is, as I said, I'm <coughs> almost selling, selling this time space plot, which is available. As I said, this goes through the whole of the Tasmanides um, and we're going to then uh, drop straight into uh, describing exactly what I've just said. So the Lachlan fold belt is that neoprotozoic to, to uh, Carboniferous evolution. And then we drop in where Northeast Queensland sits in that you can see that it shares some history but it also has this young history, including the, the Pomo Carb, Kennedy province. Um, and, and, and then we see this, uh, this uh, let's put the New England fold belt on there as well to show how there's some shared, shared history there. And the final one is to zoom in on just on the Northeast Queensland area. So this is capturing everything from the um, Carpentaria basin in the, in the West, all the way up to the Cone and the Savannah regions in the Northeast. Um, and I'm going to focus for this talk on really two main features, the, the sort of Ordovician Silurian events in the early part of the Paleozoic evolution, and then the permocarb magmatism of, of the Kennedy Igneous province. But I also wanted to show that the time space plot shows this wonderful uh, progression in terms of arcs. So the colours here all mean something in terms of the rocks. So if you see a dark purple colour with a red box around it, that is something we've identified as a potential calcalkaline arc signature. And we can see that we're just seeing that the eastern margin of Australia is, is, is constantly being having arcs secreted to it. And it's a 
quite a complex congested subduction system. Um, so any models that suggest that we just have a one long lived subduction system um, that drives everything in the back arc is probably simplistic. So there's more to be done in that area. So starting off, even though I said we're going to do Paleozoic, start off by understanding the basement rocks. And, and that's going to become relevant in a moment when we start, uh, start talking about uh, different potential fragments or ribbons of crust that may have been pulled off the eastern margin and re-accreted through time. So we've got everything from the anarchy metamorphics through to those old amphibolites in the Barnard metamorphics, which just clip the, the coastline um, through this area through here. And that's just where it sits in terms of the um, the time space plot. And we have things like the Calliophyllite that we need to consider well, what does that mean in terms of have we actually closed an ocean? What is that preserving now? And, and does that support this idea of potentially having three or three different continental ribbons that have been reaccreted? So the, the Cambrian evolution is at this point is fairly simple. Um, you know, we have the Gondwana margin. Uh, we have the deposition of the Anarchy metamorphics, the Charles Towers metamorphics, sitting in the back arc in environment in an extensional uh, back arc. And then, of course, the Lake Cambrian that is all uh, shortened during the, uh, during the Delamerian orogeny. And on the right hand side, there is just one of the examples of the plates. We have about 13 of them. I can't go through all of them today, but uh, if you're interested in that, please uh, get in touch and we can go through that. So, stepping into the early, early Ordovician, um, we can uh, highlighted in yellow here, what we think are the three crustal fragments. Uh, and we think they're, they're, they are, they are uh, several crustal rocks. So the basement of the Hodgkinson province itself uh, spits out um, inherited zircons and, and isotopic characteristics that suggest that they're derived from um, quite old crust rather than um, them it just being a, a younger sequence, which is the Mulgrave formation, which we think uh, it basically mantles the, 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 the basement block there. And then what is the Barnard metamorphic block out to the east, which again is 685 million year old amphibolites and potentially older basements as well. So that's something I want, we're going to come back to. And, I, and Nick Van Wick is going to speak more about that sort of geodynamics in a moment. So I won't get stuck on that for today's talk. Looking at that in a map view, um, taking everything from, you know, Victoria and the Selwyn block and the accretion of Vandyland and looking at where, we, where northeast Queensland sits in that. We can see in this case, I've got those three, the three basic cross, crustal fragments, the North Australian Craton over here, the Hodgkinson province, or at least the basement of the Hodgkinson province, and then the Barnard province. And one of the things we still were debating about even after we finished the work and we've done work subsequently is, okay, well, if there are arcs, uh, in the in the Ordovician, are they oceanic arcs, and therefore, what is the dip of the, the polarity and the subduction that could produce those arcs proximal to the Hodgkinson province, or are they forming on the, the eastern margin of the North Australian Craton? Um, so we kind of have to flip, flip back and forth between, between these alternative configurations. This configuration is the same in in some ways, but the difference is that there's subduction polarity is west dipping and it's on the, the North Australian Craton margin rather than sitting outboard um, forming an ocean, an ocean island arc. Um, so that's the same thing in cross section there, um, showing that potentially the, these, these arcs, which we'll, we'll, which I'll define the names of uh, in a moment, could well be sitting on transitional crust um, and, and forming there, or they could be, they could be generated on the, on the western side of the Hodgkinson uh, province that's still to be unpicked. Uh, and there's obviously science questions to, to throw at that as well, uh, which, which Mick will also discuss in a little while. Um, I think that's what I wanted to cover for that one. So I'm going to keep using this term Lucky Springs or Lucky Creek Arc as a, as a, 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 a garbage bag term for all of the Ordovician arc looking rocks that form somewhat of a semi-continuous belt all the way down the Green Vale into the Fort Lagoon area um, uh, as we go. So let's look at that. So what I've done here on the right hand side is I've pulled out all of, from the GIS in, in black here, all of the rocks that are considered to be or labelled as early Ordovician art complexes and they form this uh, belt between the Green Vale where you have the Balcuma um, arc down through the southern end of uh, Charles Towers 
and into the uh, 70 mile range, sorry, that 70 mile range here into the Fort Lagoon um, areas through there. So we start to see this quite contorted margin um, and Gidon will likely talk uh, a little bit more about that as well in his, his talk next. So we have these uh, potentially Ordovician arc uh, magmas that we can look at. Let's look at their quick, their geochemical affinities, just taking some of the work from Henderson 2011. Okay, they all plot where we expect them to. And then the plot down here on the right hand side is one that I made, um, taking the available trace and rare earth geochemistry from both GSQ data packs and Geoscience Australia. Um, and the red triangles on this bottom diagrams are the combination of all those magmatic or Ordovician magmatic arcs in that, in that belt that I just showed you. And what that showed to me was that <clears throat> the affinity of the, of the arcs through that part of the world is more of an oceanic arc affinity than a continental one. So we either need to have a hybrid idea that the, the, it's forming on a very transitional crust. So we, we're not getting that deep source of melting that we expect and therefore we would see our, our red triangles more up towards the, the high levels of thorium, thorium to euterbium. And on the right hand side is O'Neill's uh, way of classifying your rare earth patterns. So the yeah, lambda one, lambda two is basically your fractionation pattern between your light and, and heavy rare earths. And again, uh, I've plotted those against some other data sets around the world, the Marianas Trench, um, as well as the Andes to get a feel for what we're looking at in terms of arcs if they if they are there in northeast Queensland. So what the summary is that it it's probably not deep classic Andean style continental arc magnetism happening along that margin. Um, stepping through to the to to the Silurian early Devonian, um, and and obviously Rashid and Giddon's paper from 2018 has done a, a lot of work on, on, on that time period. So we're in complete agreement that rollback is, is generating um, a lot of, uh, um, I guess, truncations and, and um, strike slip faults that are occurring in, in through this, this, this zone through here. So this is the Greenvale province, this is the edge of the Chilago, and into the edge of Charters Towers in through there. And then the section on the right-hand side is showing that so schematically, um, you have to sort of ignore, everybody looks at that uh, cross-section and thinks, oh, you can't have double divergence subduction with nothing in the middle, but that's a space thing. You know, the, we think the Calopi arc is forming well out, well off, offshore or, or outboard of this whole system, but fitted into the cross-section, we've kept it, kept it in there. Um, but into the early Permian, where the Kennedy Igneous Suite has, has, has basically uh, flared up, uh, we've been able to map, as uh, I said, at the one to five million scale. So this is not going down into the granular detail, um, but staying at that scale, mapping what we think are permissible early Permian existential structures, and we're starting to see two trends in the in the in the um, Kennedy Igneous Sweep. And one of those the, one of those trends is something that I'll uh, highlight again, which is this trend of circular looking features, which look exactly the same in the magnetics and the gravity. Uh, as the Kennedy Igneous Sweep, but they're underneath the Carpentaria Basin. So if we find some permissible structural traps um, for epithermal deposits, for porphyries, then potentially that zone there is an area that explorers who have bigger budgets and deeper, deeper drilling programs may be uh, interested in the future of exploring if, if, we, if we get a better understanding. Um, so what does that look like in cross-section? We think the featherbed volcanic group Includes those A and I type magmas are forming in the in a continental back arc, and at that point, the uh, it's the Cambon volcanic arc, which is which is forming out to the to the east, and we continue to get this arc accretion occurring along the margin. Um, so, you know, in terms of the magma, we, we can see that sort of trend. We've got that north northwest south southeast trend as well as this northwest trend. Um, and forming, and we're still theorizing on whether that could relate to a slab tear um, or a continental rift. But we do see in the magnetics that trend carry on all the way to Mornington Island. So we're calling that the sort of Townsville Mornington Island magmatic trend. Um, and later on, um, I'll, I'll get to that one. I won't, I won't jump in there, but I'll, I'll say it here in this slide. So plotting, oops, plotting the uh, fault architecture that we felt was happening during the um, 
this sort of late uh, Carbonifs to Permian period. Um, the, the gray shaded area is what we've coined as the Mornington Townsville magmatic belt. But we're also seeing that when you start plotting up, uh, particularly the epithermal, the, the copper gold shows, Mangana that I've worked with with Newcrest up to Red Dome, that at a regional scale, there is there, there definitely is some organized fault intersections where there is, it seems to be a great position for uh, these, these deposits to form. You need to have the combination of north, north, west, south, south, east trending faults intersecting with northwest trending faults. And there seems to be a spatial relationship between those fault intersections and the known deposits as we know them now. So that's um, quite interesting. And that Mornington Townsville belt, it's a high angle to the rest of the, the belt. And so one of the sort of theorized ideas we had for that is, that is that actually recording the opening of the Paleo Tethy Sea? Um, you know, that's sort of one of those blue sky moments where you just go, well, why would you get a belt at high angle? Still could be an inherited slab tear instead that's extending a long way inboard, or it could be that it, we're actually recording an extensional event further north uh, from Australia. Wrap, wrapping up, Robert. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I'm wrapping oh, up. Good one. Good so one. we have, uh, in, in, in uh, conclusions, we have potentially a number of continental ribbons that may have been pulled off and re-accreted. Um, there is definitely two distinct uh, magmatic trends in the Kennedy Igneous Suite. There are definitely some major regional scale structures, both crustal boundaries that Mick's going to talk about in a little while, what do they mean and how can we test those, um, um, as well as quite a distinct belt of Ordovician calcalkaline suites, which are the same age as the Macquarie Arc. So does that make the exploration bells ring? I'm fairly interested in it. I just don't know whether there's the size and the potential. Um, there's the, the, the Auric line, which, which Mick will touch on in a moment. And we're really seeing about 250 million years of arc assembly and accretion along the eastern margin of Australia. And hopefully the report is written and in, in the, all the figures are written in a way that can be picked up by a junior explorer and they can understand tectonic where they are in a tectonic or a geodynamic setting. And of course, that doesn't mean that our model's right, but it is a model that at least allows you to throw darts at something. Um, and the research outcomes are, how, how, how can we use the stitching young magmas to understand and fingerprint those basement trains to really understand if they are truly ribbons of continental material that's been ripped off um, using in-situ geochemistry, isotopic work and forward geophysical modeling and developing and understanding how these early uh, Paleozoic uh, evolution influences critical metals systems in Northeast Queensland. And Mick will actually cover the first bit, not the uh, critical metals system. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great job, awesome. Um, we do have a request for the link um, for your report, Robin. So we'll send that through in the chat. Um, right. 